Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick, and I'm here today to talk to you about Houdini. Uh, just out of curiosity, who here has heard of Houdini before? Anybody seen a talk about it before or anything like that? Great. OK, cool. So um, awesome. That makes my job a little bit easier. Uh, OK, so a bit about me. Uh, I uh, live in Seattle with my beautiful partner, Katrina, and our son, Holden. He's the cute little baby right there. And uh, in Seattle, I work on Edge. It's the new browser from Microsoft. Uh, it's the only one we work on, i.e. is dead. And uh, one of the really cool things about working on a browser is it kind of makes you realize how far we've come since browsers started. Because you know, now we can build all these crazy, complex applications and everything. But you know, really, when browsers first started, they looked a lot more like, like this. They're just document viewers. You know, When Tim Berners-Lee actually created the first uh, web browser, he didn't even include any kind of way to control the styling. There wasn't anything that authors could control to change the way that the people uh, that, that those documents were laid out. Uh, you know, that was supposed to be in the control of the end user, the viewer of that document. They were the ones that could control the size of the headings, whether or not a document was 500 pixels wide or 900 pixels wide, et cetera. And you know, this was really frustrating. If you were a person trying to author content on the web or talk about how the web was the future, it made it really stressful, um, especially compared to other platforms. Um, so what led to this kind of semi-famous rant by Mark Andreessen, uh, where he sent an email to the early um, web development list, where he basically says it's an embarrassment that there is no way to style a document on the web the same way you can style a document on Word or Lex or any other popular educational platform. You know, it, it sucked. And it shouldn't be any surprise that a couple of months after he uh, wrote this email, he actually shipped one of the more important pieces of software of the last century, uh, Netflix, <laughs> Netflix, Netscape, sorry. Uh, he shipped Netscape and Navigator. It's the thing that ultimately pushed uh, Microsoft to join into the web and take it seriously. And it really uh, you know, completely changed the face of most consumer software. But perhaps one of the most important things and one of the most revolutionary things it did at the time was introduce the center tag. See, with that simple HTML tag, before we had bold or italic or any other kind, you introduced finally a way for authors to control the content that they're outputting. You can actually change the way that your page looked for the very first time. And unsurprisingly, within a few weeks of it being published, we actually had a proposal for one of the earliest forms of CSS. Uh, How Kun Lee, uh, eventually the CTO of Opera, sent out this proposal along with several others that existed, um, some built on like XSLT and other you know, less useful design patterns. And eventually, um, How Kun met up with Bert Boss, these two gentlemen, uh, back in 1995 at one of the very first web conferences. And they ultimately created CSS. Uh, it's one of the first books they actually published on the content manner. And it was something that was you know, the beginning of what we have today and what brought us all here today to talk about CSS. And it wasn't until about a year later in IE3 where Chris Wilson, who now works on uh, Chrome, implemented CSS as the very first time in a web browser. It wasn't very good. In fact, it didn't have the box model or anything else, but you could control font size, colors. And so the very early days were really there. It wasn't until IE5 on the Mac that we actually had a browser that supported the first version of CSS in completion. And you know, at the, by the time we shipped that uh, CSS engine in the browser, we you know, began something that is fundamental to what we have today. And that is the introduction of the rendering pipeline. Now, this pipeline can be a little bit different from browser to browser, but ultimately, these same steps are the same. This is what actually powers the browser internally and what takes your code, like the string files, and ultimately paints those pixels on the screen. Um, the first step is obviously the network step, where we download a file and then paint it on the screen. And uh, network can also include like local files. Um, if you just load from a file on your own computer, it's also the network step. It's just the loading of a file. Um, once a file has been loaded, we get into the parsing step. So parsing is uh, the process of lexing each individual character. So we actually have code in the browser or any programming language where you go through every single individual character and start breaking up and trying to recognize words that represent concepts within your code. Basically saying like, okay, you declared a variable, now you declared a sum, now you declared a CSS gradient, all those sorts of things. This happens at the, um, at the uh, parsing step. Once everything's been parsed, we go to tree generation, uh, either DOM or CSSOM. 
And that's literally as it's scanning through your code, it goes through and it starts to generate a tree-like structure. So if you've ever used Babel or any other um, kind of code transpiler, it, this, is the, this is the part where your code is being transformed. Once you have an object representation of your code, it's no longer just the string, but the actual concept of everything internally, you can modify it and, uh, or interpret it in the case of the browser. So now we have that DOM representation. This is if you've ever, you know, like done document.get element by ID, and then you get something that was what you're interacting with is those DOM parsed trees. Once we have that, we have to do the style parsing. Excuse me. Style parsing is the process of actually going through each individual rule in your CSS and each individual element in your DOM tree and starting to match all those different things. Basically, it's trying to figure out what rules match and if there's multiple conflicting rules, which rules actually ultimately win. If you've ever seen like CSS um, calculators that tell you how specific your style is, this is where that step comes into play. So now we know what rules apply to which element. We can go into the layout step. The layout <coughs> is where things start to get a lot more complicated. Uh, we now, since we already know the rules that apply to each element, we can start actually laying it out and knowing where any, any individual space or in the viewport of your uh, computer, you can position stuff. What is the x, y coordinates of it? How wide is it supposed to be? How tall is it supposed to be? If you ever have to create new stuff like um, uh, CSS grids or CSS flexbox, those are things that get introduced at the layout step. We have to rethink how boxes are being laid out on the page. Um, one big thing to keep in mind is that once you get to the layout step, everything has to be translated into pixels. Even if you use uh, M values or Vmax or any new uni unique CSS units, Ultimately, everything is a pixel on the end user screen, and as a result, the browsers have to translate everything to pixels. So if you ever do like a get computed style on something, you will always get a pixel value. Because uh, internally, that's the only thing browsers really care about. We just give you convenience methods to expose non-pixel based values. Um, yeah, so once we have the layout and we know approximately what size things are supposed to be and where they're supposed to be, we get over to the paint step. Now, what paint is, is the process of taking all of the visual graphics and stuff that you've uh, included in your code, stuff like background color, um, border size, all the different things that actually change the appearance of it, and then convert that into GPU calls internally, and then actually rasterize those things. So we'll create the nice, pretty pictures, and then we figure out how to make them ugly and rasterized and aliased inside and make sure that it matches up to the user's screen as pretty as possible. And finally, we get to the last step, which is the composite step, or the compositor. Now, before, during the layout step, I showed you this kind of a layout graph thing. Um, it's kind of a lie. Technically, at this, uh, up until now, we, it's more like this. The, lay, the paint step has generated a whole bunch of individual images. It doesn't necessarily know how to lay them on top of each other, because we don't necessarily know if something has a z-index that puts it ahead of it or anything like that. The, the browser has to make each individual thing as an individual image. So the compositor step actually goes through and starts stacking those things appropriately, making sure that things are laid out at the appropriate length and height and everything else. Though <clears throat> this is a little bit deceiving because it kind of makes it look like everything's on its own layer. And by default, with a simple style like this, it would actually be more like this. Everything would be painted onto one flat layer. Um, there are ways to get stuff to uh, elevate it to a new layer. Um, an example that was really popular was something like this. Can anybody explain what this code does, the transform origin Z? Raise your hand, I'll give you a cheap prize, please. Perfect, yeah, so what this code, oh here, you got a prize. Here's a bottle opener from Edge. There you go, yay. I had one left for the year, so you get, that's the very last one. Um, yeah, so what this code is doing is creating a fake transform that basically just says, hey, put this to its own layer. So from the user's perspective, you're not doing anything different. You're basically lying to the browser and saying, I'm gonna be doing all kinds of animation with this thing. So we go, oh, okay, we'll put it on its own layer. So when we composite stuff, we only draw that one individual paragraph tag every single time. 
So like earlier in, uh, during Ava's talk, she talked about how when you do, when you do uh, CSS transforms on height or width, you have to repaint everything. This is the, and you want to avoid that, and you want to only do the composite step. This is a cheap way to get it to the composite step. If you only do stuff there, it's much more performant, and there's less work being done, because we don't have to redraw everything. We only redraw that one little tiny area. Um, yeah, so that's the pipeline. And um, the crappy thing about the pipeline is that it always has to run from left to right. Every single time, no matter what you do, it's in that order for a reason. And so that means when you uh, do something that would cause code to be reparsed at the very, very early stage, like you dynamically insert a script tag, the whole pipeline has to start all over again. And so when you ever interact with the uh, DOM APIs, like uh, check the width or the height of something or dynamically insert anything, it goes into that DOM step, which then triggers a style, a layout, a paint, a compose, et cetera. That's those things, if you interact that way, that's what makes your laptop sound like an airplane taking off. It's because it has to go through all this work over and over and over again. And so all that kind of interactions are slow and crappy. And historically, it's been really frustrating to do anything with um, this sort of an interaction because it's slow. So what browser vendors are trying to do with Houdini are give you access to multiple parts of the rendering pipeline to make that more efficient. Um, a great example of this was like in CSS Grid, recently came out and shipped in pretty much all browsers. Um, it's, like I said, pretty much available everywhere, but it's actually been around for a really long time. Uh, Windows, Microsoft started doing this back in Windows 8 because we had grids everywhere and we wanted it to be performant. But it took five years for it to be shipped everywhere, which is kind of crappy. You know, like it was really cool five years ago, it's really cool now, but it's been a half a decade. And you know there were polyfills for it and ways to actually use these features, but they weren't really um, they were, weren't really fast. You know it had to be it was really slow because you had to go through the whole rendering pipeline over and over and over again. And so again, what Houdini does is rather than just go through the DOM APIs, we actually expose a whole bunch of new APIs so you can plug directly into the rendering pipeline, directly into the styling, the layout, the paint, the comp composition steps, etc. So. Now that we understand the rendering pipeline, we're going to go over a couple of different sections of Houdini APIs. Houdini is a collection of APIs, for those who are unfamiliar. It's not just one modular thing. It's a whole bunch of different new uh, APIs that exist in the browser that allow you to do various things. So um, very uh, first one is the property and value API. Um, now, this is really, really useful only for CSS custom properties, which is basically just uh, custom variables. Um, and you know, this is something custom variables for CSS have been shipping in all major browsers now, which is really cool. And so it allows you to write code like this. Uh, we have a, uh, we declare a single root variable, uh, in this case distance, and then we are using it for the width and height of this little box that I'm drawing. Um, and then we, on hover, just want to change that variable so that it will, um, you know, get smaller whenever we hover on it, because I'm really bad at coming up with ideas to use things. And then um, we want to do an animation, so we'll just modify the width and the height on hover. And that way it's nice and smooth rather than snapping. And so when we hover over an element, it can you know, grow and shrink. That works great. Uh, the problem is that you're kind of repeating yourself with that transition step. See, we're saying width and height, and we have to declare each one. It'd be great if we could just declare it like this. Where we're saying whenever this variable changes, animate everything that uses that variable, right? Problem. So if you do that, you get this interaction. Uh, the reason, well actually, can anybody guess why it snaps instead of does smooth? Why, why can't the browser automatically animate? Anybody? Please. Um, the thing is that CSS variables can't be animated, so the animation is actually on the, um, you, you, you can't animate the changing variable, you're actually animating the, the background or something? Kind of, yeah, you're, you're half right. You can't animate the variables. Uh, the reason, though, is because you can't animate strings. As far as the browser knows, the like distance of 400 px is just a string that's 400 px. It doesn't magically know that it's a length unit. It might as well be a color that's called 400 px. Not, the browser can't automatically know these things. And so what the property and value, ugh, properties and values API does is allow you to basically give a type to your variable. So all, it's a single API, it's called CSS.registerProperty, 
and then you uh, the only required attribute is the name field. So in this case, we're just saying, hey, for the name distance, it is a type of length, and there's a whole bunch of types that are listed there on the side. Pretty much any CSS type that exists, you can declare your variable as. And then you can also set an initial value if you want so that things can be animated. So now that we've officially told our browser that distance is a length type, you can now animate stuff because the browser is like, oh, okay, that variable is a length, so you inherit all the behavior that any CSS length has. Um, this is already shipping in Chrome and hopefully coming to other browsers soon. <coughs> and um, that little weird, you might think it's weird that you're actually declaring syntax for CSS because historically there hasn't been a way to actually know other than just you know, in your brain that a CSS type is a CSS type. Um, and where this concept is coming from is the new CSS OM spec, uh, which is the CSS object model. Earlier in the DOM generation phase, we mentioned it really quickly. Uh, it's always technically existed in the browser because browsers had to be cognizant of the concept of, all, of a CSS length. Uh, and so what the, we're really talking about here is the typed object model. That's the Houdini portion that's new and exciting. Um, effectively, a reason why this is useful is imagine for a moment you have another beautiful box and you have some text inside of it and you want to grab the width of that thing, which is easy. You know, you just do a get computed style width. It's 200 pixels because I set it to 200 pixels. But then all of a sudden, if you have more length, uh, text inside of it and it overflows, you get a little scroll bar. The width is actually, what, 180 something? 187 pixels. And that's because all of a sudden the width is subtracted from that scroll bar on the side. So if I ever had code that needed to modify the width of that page dynamically, I'd have to do some really gross hacky stuff where I get the computed style and then I parse the um, pat this each element's dot style that padding left, and then I pass that to a parse int because it, or parse float or whatever, and figure out what it is and then subtract all those things. So basically, I'm having to call those DOM APIs, get a string representation of a length, call a parse fl float on it to get a number, then subtract all those things, then put that back into a string, go back into the DOM APIs. It's all these steps and a whole bunch of indirection that makes stuff really slow. And so what the CSS OM does is it introduces these new properties <clears throat> uh, on get computed style map, and each element will also have a dot style and a dot style map. So what those do is it gives you uh, like OM direct values. And so rather than having to do a parse int, you can actually just call a dot value, and that will give you the actual integer value of those things. So you no longer have to do this parsing, and therefore it's much more performant for the browser. Um, like I said, you have a get computed style map, and you also, which queries any current element, and for any individual element, you also have a dot style map property. Both those things work just like get computed style and dot style today, just with this new object model interaction. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, if you do a um, style, if you grab the style uh, attribute on a tag, you can get the uh, width, and then you also have like a value, a value and a unit uh, attribute. And those unit attributes can be any unit, whatever you've defined it to be. You just can grab it very easily. Um, you can also set stuff, obviously, since you can have a git, and you have these new uh, CSS unit values, which uh, is one of a whole bunch of different CSS types that can be exposed. Um, so if you were to get something where it's even laid out like this, you can have the uh, x posi uh, background position has an x and a y coordinate. Uh, in this case, since y is the bottom plus 10 pixels, it's a calc value because there's all kinds of complex values that exist inside of it. Uh, and you can see the pixel value is 10, the percent is 100. Um, this might be a little overwhelming because it is, for me, I'm not terribly smart. But the thing to keep in mind with Houdini is none of this is about um, ease of use. This is all about efficiency. You're trying to get closer to the metal of the browser to make things run as fast as possible. JavaScript historically is a wonderful language because it's so easy and so forgiving. Uh, but And CSS as well, it just kind of ignores everything. But it makes it slow because the browser has to figure out what the heck you're talking about all the time. It can't take anything for granted. So it has a whole bunch of types that exist. Uh, it's a pretty active spec. You can check it out. Um, it's broken like three times in the past two months. But if you get in there today, you might be able to start using much more performant APIs in the near future. Um, so yeah, the uh, other section is going to be the worklets, which is where stuff gets a lot more interesting. Um, specifically, there's three different uh, main worklets that are exposed in Houdini at various steps of readiness. Um, now, a background on worklets, they're actually kind of a weird form of web workers. Does anybody here know what a web worker is? All right, you guys are smart. Uh, web workers have been around for, excuse me, uh, around for a really long time, since 2008, but a lot of people haven't used them actually in production. 
And just a quick refresher, you effectively just load up a file, uh, you send it a bit of code over, a, you say like, hey, do this thing, and it returns back with the string of the result of that thing. It's a, it's a thread in JavaScript, effectively. Uh, big thing to keep in mind, though, is that it's a thread, and it's event-based. It's You call post message, it sends an event, and then when it's done, it sends something back. Worklets, on the other hand, are API-based, and they're thread agnostic. So what that means is that because you're going to be hooking into the layout step, the paint step, the composition steps, you can't get an event to do that. It has to basically be able to call you arbitrarily. Whenever it needs you to, you give it a function and it runs that potentially very quick, uh, always extremely quickly and potentially thousands of times across multiple workers. So rather than fire up a whole worker, which has a lot of um, startup cost, we have this new concept of worklets. And they're uh, specifically invoked in that last part of the rendering uh, pipeline. So the first up is layout. Layout is a bit complex. Uh, it's officially called the CSS Layout API. And the way that you would interact with it ends up looking like this. Uh, you have a basic document where you're just setting up an element and some children. Uh, then you have some CSS uh, right there, where you're just saying some basic width and height, normal stuff. But then you also have this new display property, and you have a function called layout. <clears throat> this is how you will uh, use any created CSS layouts that are defined within your Houdini code. Um, you, uh, you put in a little string inside that layout function, and then that hooks into uh, this layout worklet. So all the different worklets have a window.foo worklet namespace that you add stuff to. You can add arbitrary number of modules for any of them. In this case, we're just creating a single one called masonry. Uh, so we, do, we call layout worklet.add module masonry, JS. And what that ends up doing is loading up this file. Uh, and this file is a way to do masonry layout theoretically as efficiently as you would do it any other type of layout inside of the browser. Uh, masonry layout's like that Pinterest thing. It makes it look like the bricks on the wall, you know, offset, uh, offset grid. And so what these look like internally is you define an ES6 class. Uh, it's a new JavaScript thing. And for layout specifically, you actually have to define a, um, a generator function. Generator functions are another ES6 concept. They're basically a function that can be called an arbitrary number of times and maintain state between calls. So effectively, if you imagine, remember that, that blue screen I showed you earlier where we're laying out everything? We have to be able to lay out an element, and then once we've laid out that element, we need to call that function again to lay out the next element, which is one of its children. And we have to chain it for each one of its children all the way down. Because if you have a div, it puts more stuff in it, it has to grow. And so it's a whole bunch of code that basically does that exact same stuff I was doing before. It figures out uh, how wide an element can be, how tall it can be, and the offset height that it can have. Um, I'm going to not focus on it because it's incredibly quickly changing the syntax. The idea being you're basically able to figure out the x, y, z coordinates uh, of an element at any given time and the width and the height. And then you also do the exact same thing for all of its parents. Um, sorry, for all of its children. You iterate over all of the elements within it and then you lay out all the stuff. Again, I'm being hand wavy because this is a lot more complex than I can explain in the next seven minutes. Uh, if you want to talk about more after, that'd be great. And also, it's changing all the time, so this is not going to be that useful like months from now. The big point to keep in mind is it's gross. It's really gross to do any of these APIs, but again, it's not about efficiency. It's, about easy, it's not about ease of use, it's, it's efficiency. Excuse me. You know, we're writing code to make stuff work really fast. You can already do masonry layout with JavaScript today, but it's slow. This is a way to hook directly into the browser to be efficient. Um, this is all the crap. This is why you know it's taken five years for Grid to come to other browsers is because they had to figure out how to do all this stuff as efficiently as possible in the exact same constraints that you're being given access to in the layout worklet. You know, you, you finally understand our pain and why we take so long to do stuff in browsers when you start to work with a lot of these things. Next worklet though is a lot simpler to understand in my opinion. It's the Paint worklet. It's uh, officially called the CSS Paint API, and the way to use it is pretty similar to the Layout API, but as you saw before. I'll just create a simple element. Uh, we define some normal CSS like we did before, and then we define a couple of custom things. Uh, again, we have a new function, in this case the Paint API. Paint API can be called anywhere that you would normally use an image. Uh, so a background image is a really common case. You could use it theoretically in gradient functions, um, anywhere. And then we're also defining a custom a uh, variable, in this case, uh, QR URL. And finally, we are doing the same window.paintworklet.addModule, which calls in QRJS. And that is this thing that I created. So QRJS is a 
a Houdini function where you have a register pane API where you register the QR stuff with an ESX class. And then you're able to say that I want to listen to specific properties by calling input properties. So we're basically saying the only property we care about when we're painting out this thing is QR URL. The reason you have to de de declare that is because by default, the browser doesn't know what, ne what you would need. So if you gave it everything, it would be a lot slower. Again, it's not about ease of use, it's about efficiency. So from within your paint worklet, you have the paint function. And uh, within the paint function, you have that CTX, that's a can uh, canvas context. It's the exact same canvas APIs that would use in HTML today, but you can draw at a much more efficient rate inside of the browser. And so in this case, what we're just going to do is grab that value, uh, set a min width of our element, and then draw the context using that QR uh, code generating from before. And so what that ends up looking like is this horribly ugly thing. Um, you get a QR code based off of a CSS val value, and that can be drawn whenever the page is resized, and it can be redone very, very efficiently. Not only that, you can extend the code with something like this, where we listen to key events, and uh, whenever I update the uh, text inside of that text input, it will actually repaint it automatically. So as I'm typing in uh, google.com, a new QR code is generated automatically. It's really cool. Um, and so whenever you want to create these new like uh, clip path animations like Ava mentioned before, you could theoretically change whatever pixel. You just have this blank canvas that you can draw whatever you want on it based purely off of the CSS that you use. And finally, we have animation worklet. And if you're paying attention to what the uh, rendering layout looked at before, you might think it's weird that it's not called compositor worklet. The reason it's not called compositor worklet is because <laughs> the compositor step is where everything actually gets painted to the screen. And it turns out if you mess that up, literally nothing happens. You can completely block all of the browser if you write a bad worklet. And so we have this weird intermittent step where animation worklets kind of run in the same time as the compositor, but it won't block the compositor if you mess it up. And as far as what it looks like, I don't really know because about a week ago they completely scrapped the entire spec, they deleted it, and they're restarting it from scratch. Um, they really want to make it look a lot more like, you can check it out online, um, but they really want to basically hook it into the Web Animations API. Uh, the new kind of JavaScript syntax for doing more complex animations, pretty much everything is being moved into this portion of the Houdini spec. Uh, so I'll give you a quick example of what that might look like. Um, this is an in interaction from one of the Google Chrome developers, or uh, dev advocates rather, where it's a kind of like Twitter app sort of thing where as you scroll, that icon goes up to the upper left and the um, top bar gets the opacity fades in. And so, again, I'm going to be hand wavy about this because it's not even written in as an official spec yet. But the concept would be that you add in module um, where you register a new type of a animation and then you declare a few timelines. Timelines are a web animation concept that effectively begin when you load the page and ends at the end of time. And you're basically just locking everything in. So what that means is that as you animate something, these two things should animate at the exact same speed regardless of what the input would be. Um, and then once we have that timeline, we can inherit it and basically just do these keyframe effects. So we're saying we want to transform the x value of one thing from 0 to 100 pixels and the opacity of the other thing from 0 to a full one based off of the scrolling interaction. Um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, the MDN article has a ton of web animation stuff available, but the actual compositor worklet is still really early days. Um, so hopefully that was at least somewhat useful. I know it's kind of confusing and overwhelming, but like I said before, it's all about efficiency. It's nothing to do with the ease of use. But we, at the same time, we would love to have feedback from people for, uh, as browsers. We want people to start playing with these things because that can actually change the way that these uh, APIs are used. The reason why the animation, the animation worklet was scrapped was because a whole bunch of developers said, this is crap. Like, we don't like this, and it's really confusing and bad. And so we're rethinking the way we do everything. If you play with nightlies and you start playing with browsers at an early stage, and especially these new APIs, you can change the way the web works. Like, you can really influence it. All browsers are starved for feedback from you guys and to understand what you want on the web. So ultimately, please give a ton of feedback. Um, like I said, at Edge specifically, you can go to this URL. You can complain about anything in Edge or make suggestions. Um, not about Internet Explorer, because it's dead. But um, anything with Edge, we can definitely make it better. And then, yeah, uh, thanks.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll move this chair again. Okay. And uh, we have a number of questions from Twitter. Oh, cool. Uh, we might have some written ones, but I think it's the old one. Okay, uh, we'll start from Twitter. I, th I think you still have a chance to ask a question on Twitter, so. Uh, or after, too, feel free. I'm very nice. Yeah, in person. go ahead. So, the first question for me like, I have a microphone, I can ask questions. <laughs> okay, let's turn it off. Uh, when? <laughs> I mean, uh, sure. half a decade later, like grids, sure. like too late to the party, well, like, no. like web components. So the, the big <laughs> mistake that a lot of stuff, I mean, I work at Microsoft, so I know how slow browsers can be. But um, <laughs> the big thing to keep, like a lot of, we've learned as browsers that you release things separately, like monolithic rewrites don't work. And so mm -hmm. that's why Houdini is a collection of APIs. Right. Some of those are already stable in Chrome today. Um, as far as other browsers, we'll implement them as soon as users demand it. Um, hopefully sooner. Like I'm trying, I'm pushing for a lot of these internally. But okay. if you know everyone here went on to that edge user voice and said we really want to see these APIs or each individual yeah. one specifically, we'll do it a lot faster. Like user voice side of, for, for, for Microsoft and edge features, like just just go and upvote, upvote those stuff. those things. We all, we consistently do the top three to five of every single release. Okay. So yeah. But can you guess like any API freeze date? Or API uh, freeze, API like they, they change it every day. Oh just yeah, like you said. Sure, yeah. Like the, um, the very first one I saw, the values and properties API is incredibly stable. That's okay. Great. That's pretty much going to ship everywhere fairly soon. Um, and then stuff like the animation worklet, they literally have no idea what they're doing because it was okay. scrapped yesterday. And so hopefully within the next year, year and a half, we'll have a really okay. solid view of what this looks like. But um, Ian from the Chrome team, the gentleman that's pushing a lot of Houdini, has been. Um, really, really uh, forward thinking with what he wants to do. So okay, it's great. the roadmap's fairly clear at this point. Uh, there is a question from Alexei. Um, as ex-Silverlight developer, oh. I know that Greets came from Silverlight. Mm -hmm. uh, is Houdini is inspired by Silverlight too? <laughs> or maybe <laughs> .NET? <laughs> uh, well, quick, not to, I'm going to answer the question, but quick thing about that. Um, everybody knows that IE6 like completely stopped. Like Microsoft disbanded the team after IE6, and the reason was we were at like 96% market share, and so they're like, oh, okay, the internet's over. Let's go figure out the next thing. And the next thing was Silverlight for some reason. Like they thought that was going to replace the internet, and now it's dead. So I'm very happy. But anyway, um, <laughs> so yes, to a certain extent, because Silverlight developers are now working on those standards, uh, it's influenced. But it definitely I wouldn't say it's where it came from. Um, it, it was, you know, Grid came from Microsoft, which was heavily influenced by Silverlight, okay. um, and then you know a whole lot of feedback from developers and other browser vendors. I've seen I've seen Google pushing um, a Houdini project uh, at the first first stage, and then Microsoft. And who who else? Is there any browser that not interested? Oh no! I, I, every browser has people involved in it. Um, it's just a matter of how much resources they're dedicating to it. Uh, Google is by far the biggest uh, because they're the biggest, <laughs> like they yeah, have the yeah. most resources to dedicate to it. Um, but I mean, like I know people from the Edge team, Chrome, obviously Firefox, um, Apple, Apple, uh, Apple is much more quiet and secretive, but they are involved in the discussions. That's that's really great. Uh, yeah, 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 that's about as most the best you can help from them, <laughs> other than doing it themselves. Okay, some more practical practical questions. Can you scope regist registered property to a selector? Like you can scope custom properties, or is it global? Yeah, no, no. You can you can do both. So um, you can have the the colon root, which is like a pseudo selector. Oh yeah, so the defines, same the same way. Yeah, you, that defines it globally, and then you can also just set it to an, any individual element. And whenever you set it on that element, it'll overwrite. It works just like any other CSS property. If you, if okay. you have a more specific selector with that variable inside of it, it overwrites it. Okay, yeah. it was a question from Max, like very pr practical, question, nice Max. question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and there's a question from 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 a person with a really n with nickname that I cannot read. So, <laughs> so sorry about that. When I don't name names or nicknames, I just cannot read it. So, uh, <clears throat> any plans for fractional pixel values? Like a zero, zero 0.5 pixels? Sure. I mean, uh, those are already supported in browsers today. You can declare stuff at 0.5 or 0.25 pixels. And then what happens is um, we anti-alias <coughs> inside of it, so we figure it out. Ultimately, like I said in the talk, everything becomes a full pixel value. 
It's right. just whether or not when it's, you know, scaled at that position and at that exact place in the screen, if we, you know, round it one pixel to the right or to the left, that sort of a thing. So, like, by, by stating, like, top uh, 0 0.5 pixel, you will get, uh, like, half a pixel and the until aliased? Yeah, theoretically, yeah. Okay. It, it, it really depends on a whole bunch of variables. But, yeah, okay. you can totally do that today. You've been able to do that for years. Okay, and, and what's your favorite API or use case for Houdini? Oh, God. Um, pro like the idea of a masonry layout built into the web would be great because I've had to rebuild those things like five times for different companies. Yeah. Um, and honestly, the really cool thing is that most people aren't going to actually write these Houdini APIs themselves. Yeah. But it, it's tools that allow for major frameworks like your Reacts or your Angulars. They can create much more performant APIs for everyone else that will just kind of use. This will be a new library rather than you know React. You can Im import this new API that um, this new file that does all the magic for you without you having to even understand it. Cool. Let me, let me see if there's any other questions. Um, uh, uh, Daniel uh, asking question uh, yeah. because you, you 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 were showing some some scary code like <laughs> yeah. scarier than yeah scarier than typical. Most, yeah. Uh, is there a chance to make this API more user friendly? Probably not. Honestly, <laughs> like the idea is that. Well, Sorry. No, yeah, it's, I, I believe me, I would want it to be because it hurts my brain you know, looking at it. But the idea is that we're trying to expose the concepts that exist within like CSS specifications today. Um, you know, funny enough, actually, because all browsers that exist with the exception of Edge it have existed before CSS started, like all web, all Blink, which is Chrome, it came from ultimately the KHTML engine, which started before the CSS specification really began. So the internal, the the, the idea of a layout model that, that exists in specs it is newer than most browser engines internal concepts. So they, they don't map at all. Chrome's actually doing this gigantic rewrite over the past year and a half uh, to their layout engine because they want to make it more efficient for Houdini. Um, but the goal is that if you can understand specs, you will very easily be able to understand Houdini APIs, okay. theoretically. But well, it's terrifying code, believe me. Yeah, but, but yeah, I think some, some there will be a number of plugins yeah. Yeah. that it, you can use yep. via CSS API. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there'll, there'll be, I'm sure there'll be libraries and like shim layers that make it a lot easier to in, understand and use. But as far as what's actually exposed in the browser, it's very unlikely that it'll be anything but terrifying, terrifying code. Okay. Thank you anyway. Like, everything is going to be Thank terrifying. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh.